I see. Like they're all in darkness. Which I don't know. There you are. What a cutie. So who's running this uh, show tonight? I think it's Steve. Well, I thought. I have. <laughs> I don't think so. Say- there you go, right? Everybody go like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> you most holiday committee chairperson. Yeah, I, I'm prepared to do the 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 rituals. The, not the, the the I've got the list of people to thank tonight. Um, so I was planning to do that. I do not have a menorah in my immediate vicinity. We can. I have a, I have a menorah right here. Actually, Excellent. my daughter, will, a lovely my lovely assistant, will take a break from quesadilla and, and probably plan to hold the. Well, Mishka's well, so have they right already, there. They already, they already oh, lit. Ours are, ours are already lit. lit but yeah, we kids. should have one this year. Mishka said already lit. Right, because we lit them with our <laughs> <our kids. laughs> Joe is the master of ritual committee. Do you know who's supposed to lead the minion tonight? Usually it's the um, rabbi. It's, it's me. Well, that I knew. <laughs> but not now. So, you, so yeah, now. it's normally rabbi. And so I'm going to take it over for tonight. So that was okay. my plan. So that's cool. That's why I'm Joe, that. Unless someone else would love to do it. Joe, the new kitchen looks good. Oh, it is finished finally? I don't know. <laughs> no. it's, so, but... it's moving forward, though. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah, the day of badness. Oh, the day of badness. Okay. Well, let's give uh, let's give Team Roe in there, Team Farad, another minute or two to get their menorah set up. But we do have an adult ed class at 7.30 tonight, as far as I know, so we do oh. want to make sure that we... We run to Come time on, tonight. It's not, it. it's not. It doesn't need to be en- re-engineered. It just needs to I'm have the candles it. put in. We actually have another one already loaded, but but he wants to use the one that yeah. Hillary gave him for his box. Oh. Oh, Very nice. Thank you for joining us. I imagine we will have a minion. Okay, so we'll start. We when, we'll start when we get all clear. <laughs> Hey Art, could you could you lead a Marie tonight since I'm on the iPad, which is slow? Sure, whatever you want. And I'll switch over and join you later. Is that okay? Whatever you'd like, Joe. Yeah, why don't you lead Marie tonight? Uh, and I think there'll be plenty of opportunities for everybody over the next six weeks. <laughs> yes, I, I agree. Got a lot of holes <laughs> to fill. No shortage of opportunities. All right. All right. See? All right. Well, then why don't we proceed? Hello, hello, we got our fire going here. Come over this way. No. You're trying to light my sleeve on fire. Oh. Maybe light, my light, the, light the menorah, not the mob. Light the menorah, not the mob. We couldn't get much higher. Not the mob. <laughs> I'm burning, I'm burning, I'm burning for you. <laughs> oh. I thought that was Parshat Para. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> we had we had hoped to um, have somebody down at the big menorah tonight and being able to flip the light on, at least have it on Zoom, but that is not possible. The early reconnaissance convinced us that it was not going to be a good idea to try to get somebody to the big menorah tonight. We will get that eighth light flipped on, but uh, it has not happened yet. You know, I'm probably have to have a little bowl sort of thing. Yeah. Around the mods, sir. Mods, yes, you are. Let's go. 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 Let's 
sounds great that it's a mix-up. <laughs> no, it doesn't need to be in unison. No, or wheel. Well, it's, it's not going to be in Zoom. So, so Steve, you have a uh, set of announcements. Uh, unless Hillary is planning to do them, I'm going to defer them over to Hillary if she wants to do it. You're muted, not though, Hillary. Yourself. You're not Can't allowed to do it yourself. muted. Can't hear you. Oh, okay, there we go. So I can, and then if you want, if Steve and Deb, if you want to fill in blank, that would be awesome. All right. um, so our intent tonight was to, thank, around our giant menorah, was to thank um, everybody who was involved because it was a really big effort. Um, I have to say the, the extra special thanks go to Rabbi Spitzer for having his vision to have our giant menorah um, he came to us at a board meeting, I think it was the October meeting, and he proclaimed that he wanted us to have a loud and proud Hanukkah celebration. So Deb and I took on the task of um, acquiring the menorah. Um, and again, this wouldn't have happened without Rabbi's vision. So we have him to definitely thank for that. Um, in terms of the acquiring of the menorah, we, um, have to thank Women's Network, Men's Club, the Membership Committee, um, the Judea Committee, and Rabbi's Discretionary Fund, who all funded um, various um, parts of it. Well, Rabbi's Discretionary Fund funded the painting, and then all the other groups um, are sharing the cost of the purchase of the menorah, which is super awesome. Um, so we, um, we found it, we acquired it, we got the people to pay for it. And then once it got there, we have to thank Josh for his enthusiasm and his help in putting it up and putting it together. Um, Joel and Howard for taking on the building of the giant base to make sure it stays secure. Um, although if we knew we were gonna get all the snow, we probably wouldn't have needed the base because I think the snow will just hold it in its place. Um, so we have them to thank. Um, and then when it was time to finally, you know, put, get it ready for Hanukkah, thank you to Steve and Gideon and Josiah who actually schlepped it out and made sure it was standing and all the arms were in the right places and the colors were in the correct order. So um, lots of different people to thank and also to thank Howard um, for getting, making sure the banner was put up. Um, we know next year we'll put it closer to the menorah because both things are pretty far apart from each other. So we live and learn and we had a great start to the celebration this year and you know look forward to continuing to be able to use it next year um i did this all off the top of my head so i apologize if i forgot anybody to thank steve or deb can you think so, of jackie thank you for your support and letting us do our thing mm -hmm. and supporting us along the way as you always do and Steve, I know you were involved in a couple of different phases, so thank you. But what I wanted to say was the rabbi had this vision and when he first came to us, we talked about how um, we can make a mark in the community and get more PR and get more people involved. And this was a really great opportunity for us with people driving by and people gathering and a big article in the paper. And I, I heard a lot of good comments about how thrilled people were to see it and didn't we, why didn't we have one before and wasn't there always one there? So I think it really hit the mark and we're thrilled how it worked out and um, thank you all so much. I'd like to uh, add in the people who did programming around the eight different nighting lights. This was basically running eight synagogue events in eight days, and some of them were on Zoom where they were a little less elaborate, but a lot of people contributed to both the Zoom nights and the in-person nights. I want to make sure we thank those folks. Um, for the first night for the Hebrew School, Jack Mincer and Chris Parisi did a lot of work. 
for the second night. Um, I think it was going to be Murray Jaros, but uh, internet connections kept him away. So Rabbi led that night. And I can't remember who led the, lit the candles that night, but we had a candle lighting. Um, Saturday night, I think Joe picked it up on Saturday night. Yeah. Um, Sunday was Susan Sharstein for USY, put all that together. Um, Monday mm -hmm. night was Men's Club. Uh, Steve and how uh, uh, Steve Cohen and Joel Weingarten and uh, Howard Wall, who had worked sure? on the construction, also helped with that. Andy Gavins was also helpful in putting the Men's Club evening together. I want to thank him. And for uh, Network, Mishka Luft was instrumental, and Roberta Steiner was also very helpful in making it come together for Women's Network. Uh, and the we would have had a menorah, but we would have had no celebration if those folks hadn't stood up and made the events possible so we want to thank them too yeah. did i add something mm -hmm. can you hear me yeah yeah um so uh, i just wanted to add uh thank you for to uh, risa and sharon and michael console and ricky shapiro who made all those donuts for the first night to share with everybody who spent about five hours in the kitchen making those donuts so, yeah, they were delicious. Thank you. Thank you. Deb and Hillary, I was, when I heard about the menorah, I was kind of like, okay, <laughs> but it's gorgeous. You hear me it's just fabulous. And I, I was delighted to be able to be there the, the, you know, the first night so I could see it in the day, daylight. And then the picture in the paper uh, is just up. fabulous. Just really showing how you had the rainbow structure. And it was beautiful. Great sense of community. And we actually had advisement from Randy, correct? To, of the That's right. Of colors. Hmm. Yeah. Great, great. So a lot of, lot, it was, it was pretty, what makes it, what one of the things that makes it so awesome and so special is that so many different people were involved and everybody really worked together to just make this whole thing happen. Rabbi wanted our menorah to reflect um, diversity in our congregation. And I think it certainly does. Oh, my, my fine bar. <laughs> anyway, we know you have a meeting, so. So we'll get going we'll with Bart. So we'll let, let me just add thanks to Hillary and to Steve. Steve, you weren't giving yourself credit for doing all that you have done. To and Deb, and Deb, especially Deb. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to thank, just as a congregant who was not involved at all, I would like to thank all of you who were involved because it was a beautiful project and you added so much to the to our synagogue. So thank you. And, and this Zoom way of celebrating together is is quite quite nice to bring all fa many families together, lighting candles. Yeah. And thanks to Josh for being our documentarian and getting things uh, uh, photographed and, and recorded. And also uh, you know, the Gazette photos that he shared with us. Although I want to tell you, I, I'm looking at those photos from the Gazette and looking at the menorah standing on grass. And I got to tell you, it doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> those, those little red reflector lights are now about four inches above the snow line, no further. Probably pr looks pretty cool reflecting on the snow though. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Oh, Josh. Okay, so we're going to get started with Mari because we have to get going so that there's okay. an right. education program. I've got to move my we need, first of all, we, we need everybody to unmute themselves. Everybody has to unmute themselves to be part of the minions. So please do that now. I don't have the. Right. <clears throat> all right, so we'll begin with the, uh, the last night of Hanukkah, Mari's service on page 200. 200. If you're not unmuted, please unmute yourself. Uh, Murray and Edith, and there's a couple others. Rakum yecha perabon velo yashki per bala shiva povelo yirka kamato Adonai oshi amelch yanenu biyom korenu. Arfu and Adonai amavora. Rakli alam voed. Be seated. Baruch <laughs> 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 
Beginning on 210, be sure to add Alanisim for Hanukkah.
when you completed your Amidah, if you could unmute yourself so we could tell that you're done. Jack's <laughs> calling. <laughs> Would you take it? If you haven't completed your Amida, please continue to do so. Uh, when you're done, unmute yourself. We're going to continue with Kadish Shalem on page 222. <laughs> Barak Okay, na kavala kadona Elohim le Amir. Moni Almoni, what the hell is that? Who? I don't know. Somebody's trying to connect. Cloney oh. Almoni. Oh, that's um. <laughs> Yeah, Marbaya and Ila Melaka call our ads by Yamuina Echad, Ushmo Echad. Borders in New York Times Kaddish is on page Hadah, <laughs> Hope everybody happy a couple of announcements before we turn Amen. over to adult education. First, there's been a request for a, a minion tomorrow morning. Uh, Hal Haber has a yard site tonight and tomorrow. Fridays are historically a very bad day for attendance. It's the last day of Hanukkah. If you can help us make a minion tomorrow morning at 7 15, uh, that would be a very good thing if you could do that for us and for uh, and, and for, for Hal Haber as well. Um, Mincha and uh, Kabbalat Shabbat tomorrow afternoon, a few minutes after three o'clock. And uh, we'll bring uh, Shabbat in and say goodbye to Hanukkah for, uh, for this year as well. Um, and I'm gonna now turn it over to uh, uh, adult education. Uh, again, mazel tov to uh, Rabbi Spitzer on the birth of his, uh, his grandson. And to the grandfather. Thank you, thank yeah, you. Yeah, we got grandfather. I'm not a rabbi, my wife's the rabbi, but, but I'll, take, I'll take the congratulations in any case. You look like a, you look like a rabbi. <laughs> like, thank you. Um, I've, been, I've uh, been enjoying the pictures and I even got a little video of um, Ellie holding baby shark. Um, oh. And uh, 
Do, do we know the cute. name? Do we know his name? No, no. The baby's no, name no, is no. Baby Shark okay, until okay. otherwise named. Until the bris. <laughs> Okay, yeah, until baby, the baby okay. shark, you know, from the Washington baby National. Shark. <laughs> no, don't sing it. It's a, it's a real mind worm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So while uh, while the new the grandpa is going to be an adult education, uh, Debbie and I have to go and play grandparents to our kids in uh, Colorado. So uh, oh, I told everybody. I told everybody. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye, Bye. See everyone. Thank you. Bye. Baby shark. Baby shark. Anyway, Ellie looks really cute, and and and, and pretty much since they got home around three thirty, um, Ellie has not spoken to them at all. She's really just only interested in talking to baby shark. So <laughs> it's very cute. Um, and I am looking forward to my time when I can come up and visit. Um, and uh, I um, didn't jump in because it was really a congregational thing, but I've very much enjoyed um, looking at um, your Hanukkah as well. Um, uh, my wife, Rabbi Spitzer, has been leading um, um, Hanukkah Licht here for her congregation um, here in Scranton. Um, but whenever um, we've been on Zoom with Rafi, um, with with your Rabbi, with the younger Rabbi Spitzer, um, he always has that uh, Hanukkah on in the in, in his background, and it looks really lovely. And I'm very very pleased for you. Okay, well, it's 7:28. I don't know whether we should start. In any case, yeah. um, how well, much snow did you get? Uh, we had about 14 inches. Oh, oh significant. Um, and double it for here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I, no, I saw the I saw the pictures of Ravi shoveling out the car. So. <laughs> well, I heard that Binghamton got the most. That they got yeah. slammed. Forty. Yeah, we had we had, we have friends. Forty two. Friends there too. Has anyone's roads been plowed in Niskayuna? Yeah. Uh, yes, ours were plowed. Yes, but not well. Sore plowed. No, we've got I nothing. Really? Where yeah. you are, you got nothing. Yeah. We no, had, we, we, yeah, we, got, we, we, we had about six fairly. inches. We had about six inches added to the 30 across the front of our driveway this morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there oh, was God, a wall. Yeah. There's a wall in front of the in front of the driveway. Yeah. We had this weird thing up on Peters. I don't know whether you saw that, Anita, where the big snow plow got stuck and they had to get a smaller snow plow. No, I didn't see that. To get the snow, big snow plow out. Oh, really? I didn't see that's that. No. Weird. Well, that's what that was about, huh? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh. No, I, I, I had figured it'd be about seven or eight inches. Figured I could drive back into it. We could get the snow plow out, a snow blower out. And, and, and then, you know, when I, we got up in, at five o'clock in the morning and there was five inches, 15 inches. And then at, at eight o'clock when there was 30 inches, <laughs> we had to, had to dig out the front of the driveway to get the car out, to get the snow plow, snow blower out. Yeah. <laughs> Are you ready to go? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, I think Welcome it's back all you adult ed fans. This is another in our series with uh, Jeffrey Spitzer, the new uh, grandfather in our uh, congregation. Also, Tom. Thank you. Yes. And today's uh, uh, talk is I don't have it in front of me. Why one of the two Talmuds is the Talmud? Right. Um, so. Just to give you context, um, people tend to publish however they like to publish. Um, and as a uh, um, as a, a word of just like disclaimer, um, I did my doctoral work on the Talmud Yerushalmi. That is the, the Talmud that didn't win. Um, and that's this one here. Um, you can get the entire... You get the entire Talmud Yerushalmi in one book like this. This is this is the entire Talmud Yerushalmi. Um, you can't get you can't get the Talmud Bavli like that um, because it's just too big. Um, this is the Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud that I was given actually when I um, became engaged to my wife. The ah. gift from my gift from my father-in-law. It's printed in 1865 to 1867 mm. uh, in Berlin. <clears throat> and that's the one that won. And the question is, why? What happened? 
And we're gonna use that question as a way into looking at the changes from that last time um, um, about, the, about the Mishnah and even before the Mishnah and the second Temple period. Um, and, um, and use that as a way of looking at the history. So just to review, this is what we covered in the first class, um, everything from creation through the Hasmonean period. And then in the last class, we looked at through the Hellenist, from the Hellenistic period um, and the Septuagint, and we looked at, and we looked at Hasmonean revolts, and we talked about the beginnings of rabbinic Judaism and the Mishnah. Um, and today we're going to look at that transition between the, um, the historical context between the Mishnah and um, the Talmud. So just to put us in context about the periodization, which I think is a little complicated in the ways we refer to this period. Um, in 63 BCE, the Roman consul Pompey brings this massive army through Roman Asia, which is currently, which is now Turkey, down the Mediterranean coast, all the way to Egypt, conquering Judea along the way. And that begins the uh, Roman period for the Jews. And just to put that in context, Hill of the Elder comes after the, was born during the Roman period, um, lives across the time period when, it, when we now call it the Common Era. Um, so now we have some overlapping periodization. Um, the first period that we look at is called the Tanaitic period. That's the period when people whom we call Tanaim, um, which is Aramaic for the Hebrew Mishnot, meaning to repeat, the Tanaim are people from the time of the Mishnah um, and are the rabbis who were included in the Mishnah. Um, and that's from the year 70 CE, that is with the destruction of the temple, to 200 CE, which is approximately when the Mishnah was completed, although it was probably published about 20 years later. Um, and when, when that's the, the publication of the Mishnah. Um, after the Mishnah was published, it was studied intensively, both in the land of Israel and outside the land of Israel, um, in Bavel. Um, and the people, the rabbis who spent their time studying the Mishnah were called the Amoraim. Um, and their statements are identifiable. They, they, they have a very particular style, although it changes over time. Um, and it is not actually the work of the Amoraim, which gives the, the, the Talmud Bavli its unique style, um, although it's really much more significant in the way the Yerushalmi takes um, its structure, and we'll talk about that later. What really makes the Talmud Bavli the Talmud is the work of these people who were only named in the past um, um, few decades, um, the Stamaim, the Stamaitic period. Um, Stam means anonymous um, in Hebrew, and the Stam is the way that modern Talmud scholars refer to the anonymous superstructure that creates the editing structure for the Talmud. So most of what is in the Talmud is a function of what these final editors, the Stamaim, did. Um, and my teacher, David Weiss-Olivni, and, um, and um, my colleague, Jeff Rubenstein, um, have done a lot of work on the, on the literature of the stomach, the stomach period um, and how that produced. And if you take a look at the, at the, the Tanaitic period, the Amoraic period, and the Stamaitic period, altogether, that works out to be the, um, the Talmudic period. Um, from 70 to about 620, which brings you into the beginning of Islam, right? And you can see this is a screenshot from the timeline that's on my website. And you can see, right, here's, here's the Tenaitic period, here's the Amoraic period, and here's the Stemaitic period. A um, little bit of overlap because we end the Tenaitic period about in 220, and all of that is the Talmudic period. Um, some of the literature that was produced during this time period, besides for the Mishnah that we've already spoken about, and the Talmud Yerushalmi and the Talmud Pali, which we're going to, are is Pirkei Avot, which many of you have spent time studying. Um, 
the ethics of the fathers or the ethics of our, the, the sayings of, of, of the fathers. Um, Pirkei Avot is traditionally thought of as part of the Mishnah, although most scholars date it to be a little bit later than the rest of the Mishnah, um, kind of a capstone for the Mishnah, um, in some ways an introduction to the Mishnah, um, and um, even though its style is very different than the rest of the Mishnah. Um, and I would, and we're actually going to be looking at the first Mishnah in, in, in Pirkei Avot. The Tosefta we saw in a, um, we saw last week is a document that looks like the Mishnah. It collects did materials which we call baraitot. Um, it's B-A-R-A-I-T-O-T, baraitot, um, which are materials from the Tanaitic period that didn't make it into the Mishnah. Um, also considered baraitot are the, are the things that made it into the Midrash Halacha. Again, these are Tanaitic midra, uh, Midrashim. They are comments on halachic parts of the, of the Torah, um, and usually not only deal with halachic issues, that is legal issues, but they try to, but they're organized around um, the books of the Torah. So for instance, the Tenet Midrash Halacha in the book of Shemot is this book here. Sorry, this book here, this book here, the Mechilta, um, and those books, each each of the books where of the Torah where there is halacha, that is Shmot, Nehra, Bamidbar, Dvarim, Exodus through Deuteronomy, has their own book um, or two books of Midrash Halacha. Um, there's also books of Midrash Agada. Um, those are books that really look more at not halachic issues, but narrative issues, agadic issues, theological issues. Um, when um, uh, Rabbi Spitzer says, so there's this midrash that says, um, or I read in a midrash, he's not talking about midrash halacha. He's usually talking about midrash agada. Interesting question, do the original documents exist? Absolutely not. Um, what we have are copies of copies um, and um, we have no idea how, who wrote these things or how they were put together. There's all kinds of questions about the, the process um, in which they were edited. Um, and there's a, still a lot of scholarship that needs to be done in terms of figuring out how these things came to be. Um, but the actual documents, the texts were quoted early on um, by rabbis in the 10th and 11th and 12th centuries um, as documents with these names. Um, so we know that the books existed. Um, before that, people were referring to isolated passages. And it's not clear that the books were actually organized as books, um, even though materials all come from that period. Just a little bit of um, political stuff. I mentioned the publication of the Mishnah. The publication of the Mishnah was accomplished by uh, Rabbi Yehud Hanasi, Rabbi Judah, the patriarch. Um, it is not clear when the patriarchs, patriarch gets started, but it was kind of a political um, leadership of the Jewish people vis-a-vis -vis the vis-a-vis -vis Rome. Um, some people date it all the way back to the destruction of the temple. Some say even before that, um, and it doesn't seem to, that doesn't not seem to be the case. But it went, but we do know when it ended, and that was in 425 CE because in Rome they didn't want it anymore. Um, and, uh, right after that is when the Talmud Yerushalmi comes to a close. Is it, did it come to a close because it no longer support, um, was supported by the financial support of the patriarch? Not clear, but it does come to a close in 430. Um, there's another whole body of literature, which I'm not going to get because it's on the other side of the computer. Um, but I spent a lot of time studying, um, is Piyut, that is uh, liturgical poetry. Um, and some of that is, like we looked at last time, and at Mandahadar goes back to very early times. Um, but um, the bulk of the poetry um, by people like Elazar Varevi Kalir um, were, um, were written in this period um, in, um, under Byzantine rule. And then it's in 620. You have the close of the Talmud Bavli, although um, both David Weiss Olivni and Shama Friedman 
um, are now saying that the date is later um, and I'm willing to take them on it, take them up on it. Um, haven't actually adduced too much evidence other than the evidence they've adduced towards that is indirect, but their judgment is better than mine. Um, so it might be later than that. But in any case, you can see there's at least a gap of, of almost 200 years, if not more, between the conclusion of the Talmud Yerushalmi and the Talmud Babali, and that's actually going to go a far way um, towards explaining our question. And here you can see that those same periods with the documents laid out. And you can find this again, simply by going to the, uh, the timeline and clicking on from Genesis and you'll see all the things that I've mentioned. Um, so that's that, okay. So I wanna talk about um, a huge thing, which is the legacy of the destruction of the second temple um, because it forms a huge amount of what becomes the Talmudic um, period. Um, and a lot of what emerged in the Talmudic period by these rabbis was out of their memory and their construction of what actually was going on um, in the Second Temple. So there were a huge number of um, divisions in Jewish society um, during the period of the Second Temple ethnic divisions between Jews and Greeks, including the Greeks who were in the army of the Roman occupiers. There were as well um, political divisions between people who rejected Ro Roman authority and those who didn't reject Roman authority. And among those, those who rejected Roman authority, whether they believed in or expected a return to kingship in Israel, which is what we call messianism. There were economic differences between the rich and the poor. Um, and there was widespread um, looting and crime. A lot of this was due to um, huge amounts of taxation um, and graft um, among the Roman administration um, or by the Roman administration. Um, there were social differences, especially between the Galilee in the north and Judea in the south, as well as between urban and rural populations. All of these conflicts show up in the in the work of Josephus, who really deserves his own course, um, um, and you can and you can see that um, the, the, these kinds of uh, differences, and then of course there were theological differences, many of which have to do with actually with the existence of the temple. So ironically, when the temple was destroyed, as tragic as it was, you know, um, you know, seventy thousand people were killed in that war, uh, Jews were killed in that war. Um, it was many of the reasons for divisions amongst Judaism um, disappeared. So the first response that we saw last time was this effort to be inclusive, right? Um, and we saw how that worked. Um, they included, um, uh, they, they had a conscious desire by the rabbinic community to develop models of how to handle dissent without causing division. So they developed a culture that modeled showing kavod, showing dignity to those who disagreed on issues of law and keeping the dissidents at the table by recalling their names and only their names um, in the record of a legal dispute in the Mishnah and claiming that their opinions um, didn't win the vote but could still end up being the law um, according to a later, uh, later court. So now we're gonna take a look at Mishnah Avot um, and I'd like you to um, take a close look at, at this very first passage here. Um, I've highlighted some words that I think are really important, um, but would somebody like to read this passage? And it, I'm sure it's familiar to many of you, if not all of you. Just unmute yourself and you can read the passage aloud. Hebrew or English? Either one. Oh. Everybody has a translation or the original. Moshe kibel Torah misinai umesara le Yoshua. The Yoshua l'tchanim uskenim l'nvim unvim mesarua l'anche chneset hagdola. Hem amush loshad varim. Hevu metunim badin. Veha amidu talmidim arbe. Veha asu siag la Torah. Now I have to read the English so I can understand what it says. Okay, but everybody else already did. Um, but you can see oh, this is a 
this is a this is a particular kind of document, right? What, what's what's the goal of this document? And those of you who um, those of you who have the document from Safari, I have I gave you not just the first Mishnah, but I gave you the first two chapters um, with again specific parts highlighted. Um, what's going on here? Is this is giving this is giving some sort of um, um, chronology. Well, it's giving chronology, but it's also giving some sort of, uh, um, oh God, I can't think of that word, um, authenticity to what comes. That uh, what is what has- Authenticity, and I would say authority. Authority, that was the word I was right? saying. It's making, it's making a particular authority claim, right? Um, a, person reading this, a person reading this passage is going to, um, is going to say, oh, that stuff that my rabbi's teaching, he got it from his rabbi. Who got it from his rabbi? Who got well? Actually, your rabbi got it from me and, and from <laughs> and from his mother. But like, they got, and, and from his many other teachers, but they got it from their rabbis. Who got it from their rabbis? Who got it from their rabbis? And so forth and so on. Who got it from Joshua? Who got it from Moses? Who got it from God? Right, and that's a claim of authority, and that's really powerful. Um. And in the process, they are. I, I, I thought I thought uh, at Sinai all of Israel received the Torah. Ah, that's so great, right? So if that's the case, then what? If all of Israel received the Torah, then what are they talking about when they say Torah here? Well, he's the one who went up to Mount Sinai to get it. That, that's true, but oh, but skip then it. he oh. certainly didn't. He didn't turn it just or, to Joshua, or, right? If all or, of Israel or, got it. So, so they're, they're they're using Torah in a very specific in a very specific way, and it's not the way that you just used it, right? When they were talking, when they said Torah, um, um, here, okay, right? You said Torah. Everybody got everybody got this Torah at Sinai. So what Torah did Moses get, which he transmitted to Yehoshua, that others didn't get? The oral Torah? Exactly so. So when so th this document is not trying to make a claim about the written Torah. Everybody could see the written Torah, right? You could go into a synagogue and there's a, there's a there's you know a scroll of the written Torah. That didn't require authority. That had authority. Everybody knew that, that had authority. What this is claiming is oral Torah, that is rabbinic Torah, what I like to call conversational Torah. Um, rabbinic Torah is what is being passed by Moses to Joshua, to the elders, okay? And note the language they use. It's a really important, it's really um, important language, right? They use this term Kabbalah and Masorah, okay? So, right, Moses Kibel, right? He received it. Okay, and so when people talk about the Kabbalah, they're not using it in this way. But it is, in a sense, this is something that is old and traditional. I received it, and I have an equal obligation not just to receive, but to also pass along to, to, to transmit it. But these are two, two uh, sides of the same coin. And if we look back at this passage, right, you've got a very interesting um, chain of tradition here. Okay, so everybody just take a look and make sure that you see it in the context. Moses, Joshua, elders, prophets. Okay, and this is it. This is the this is the list of the people who get this thing. And if you go, if you, those of you who are looking at the Sparia passage, will realize it says, "Oh, and this guy was the last of the great assembly." And then it gives you a list of pairs of, of scholars, working down to Shemaya and Abtalion, and eventually to Hillel and Shammai for after Shammai and Avtalion and say, oh, Hillel, Shammai, I know those guys, right? And then it talks about Yochanan and Zakkai and Yochanan and Zakkai's students. And we're gonna spend some more time talking about, um, about those particular people. Um, but it's, it's very clear that they're trying to establish um, a list of who's authoritative. What is strange about this list? Okay. 
nobody's gonna have any problems with Moses, right? And nobody's gonna be any problem with Joshua, right? We all know Moses, we all know Joshua. Liturgically, we try and make that connection between Moses and Joshua and Simchat Torah when we finish the Torah and the Haftorah that we read is Joshua. But can anybody name one of the elders for me? Yeah. No, of course you can't name the elders because the elders are an unnamed group. The elders are, are, are people who we have no idea who they are, right? What normally comes after Joshua is the judges. Can anybody name some judges? Solomon. No, oh. Solomon, Solomon is one of the kings. Samuel. Samuel, um, Samuel, is, Samuel is the last of the last of the judges and the first of the prophets, but but the thing about Gideon or Yifta, mm -hmm. right? Anybody read Jephthah's right? Jephthah's, I'm, um, Jephthah's daughter, right? These are not great people. Um, Samson. Right, he um, also was sleeping around. Like the judges are not the greatest people, right? So if you said according to the, the order that shows up in the Tanakh, Moses taught it to Joshua, Joshua taught it to the judges, right? Then people would say, "Ooh, really? Do I trust those judges? They are not necessarily my the most savory characters. They are not necessarily people I like." But if instead you say Moses passed it to Joshua and Joshua passed it to the elders. I, I, I dare you to say something bad about one of these elders. And none of you can because no, you have no idea who no, they no. are. Right? The, by, by saying Moshe, Joshua, Zikanim, the elders, what you've done is you've created an unimpeachable tradition because nobody can say anything bad about the elders because nobody knows who they are. Right? Then it goes from the elders to the prophets, okay? And you might say the elders goes to the, the next person would be the prophets, but who might, I mean, if, who, if you're thinking Moses and Joshua, who, who would be next in line you would think of as having the, the authority in Israel? Not the prophets, but- The king? The kings, right? But it doesn't mention the kings because again, right, like, well, like some of them we kind of like, but most of them have some serious challenges. David has some serious challenges. Saul has some serious challenges. Solomon has some serious challenges. And then when you get to Yaravam and all the kings in the north and, and a bunch of the kings in the south, again, not the greatest. Prophets, we're okay with them. So Moses, Joshua, elders, prophets, that's great. And then this great assembly, right? Sorry, um, it's the same problem with the elders. We have no record of a great assembly. There's no indication that there was ever a great assembly. None of our earlier sources tell us who was a member of the great assembly. We don't know anything about them. So this is again, unimpeachable because we have no idea who they are, but it makes it makes for a good political claim. Oh, you can't say anything bad about these people, right? The people who were actually in charge after the Kings, after the, after the return from exile were the priests. And some of those priests were probably not the authoritative one, like the Maccabees, for instance, who were not actually from the right family, okay? So Mishnah Avot is actually making a strong claim. It's trying to say our Torah, that is our oral Torah, our, the stuff that makes us the rabbis, it's unimpeachable. It goes all the way back, Joshua to Moses to God, and you can't say anything bad against it. Because who knows? You can't say you can't say anything bad about these people. The church was doing the same thing, right? If you take a look, if you take a look, this is a, a text from Irenaeus, one of the church fathers in the second century, um, and he's describing what they call the the tr the, the chain of tradition um, of the episcopate, and and you can see how they mention Linus and Anacletus and and Clement and Evaristus, and they go on and on. Um, in order, these are the people who were the, the, the people who were the head of the ecclesiastical tradition in, in this case in Rome. And this is the way they, they established their authority by saying, I've got an unbroken chain of tradition, trust me, right? May not be entirely accurate. It may not be entirely true. We don't know who those elders are. We don't know who the 
great, members of the Great Assembly are if they actually existed, but you can't argue against it. So if we think about the legacy of the Second Temple, right? We had all these divisions and the first response, which was inclusiveness, the second response, right? The second response is establishing authority by making a claim of tradition. We are authoritative. You can trust us, okay? In this period where you have this huge social disruption, like a, the destruction of the temple, which was the major religious, political, and economic in, and cultural um, institution of Judean society, being able to say that you're continuous and you go all the way back, that must have sounded pretty good. So now we're going to look at another early text. Okay, the a vote was a Tanaitic text. This text is also a Tanaitic text. Um, and Steve referred actual uh, Steve referred to that the fact that there was a rabbinic passage that was parallel to the story in Two Baruch about throwing the keys up. That's from this. But we're gonna, we're going to stop a little bit earlier. But I, I want to, and many of you probably know a version of this story. Um, of Yohanan ben Zakkai leading Jerusalem. This may not be the version that you know. You may know a different version, and we'll talk about we'll talk about the, the different version um, afterwards. But take a look at this one. Um, Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai was leaving Jerusalem, and he was with Rabbi Yehoshua, his student. And Rabbi Yehoshua is very distressed because he thinks the temple's been the temple's been destroyed. How are Israel's sins going to be forgiven? And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai says, my son, do not be distressed, for we have a form of atonement just like it. And what is it? Acts of kindness. And he proves it from a verse. So Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai is already developing a theology. And this is, you know, again, about the Rabbi Natan, probably mid-third century um, text. They've developed a theology that says, like, we, done it, we don't actually need the temple. We can do other things. We can do tshuva. And then they tell, then there's a flashback and he goes back to what Yohanan ben Zakkai experienced when the temple, before the temple was destroyed. And he's in the siege of Jerusalem and Vespasian is laying siege around Jerusalem. And according to this, this version of the story, Vespasian calls out to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they say, fools, why do you seek to destroy the city and burn the holy temple? And he says, all you have to do is just give me a simple sign of your surrender and it won't be any problem and the zealots respond just as we went out to battle against the two who came before you that is son the assyrian king and antiochus the seleucid king and killed them so we will go out against you and kill you and then in a really beautiful literary uh, piece rabbi yochanan ben zakai repeats the same quite repeats the same comedy says my children why do you seek to destroy the city and burn the holy temple? All you have to do is submit. And they make the exact same response. So from a literary perspective, what is it trying to do by saying what Spasian says? Yohanan ben Zakkai says almost the same. What is, it, what is it trying to make out of what either Vespasian said or Yohanan ben Zakkai said? How are you supposed to read that? Okay, well, I, I'll tell you what I think. I think that they're trying to make um, the, 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 the claim is inevitable, right? Whether you look at it from the Romans' perspective or Yochanan ben Zakkai's perspective, you just have, you have to accept that that's what's going to happen. And that the zealots were wrong. And from the perspective of, and perspective of, of rabbinic Judaism, the zealots were wrong. They, they, they caused the temple to be destroyed. They're the ones who were at fault. And in this version of the story from Avot Rabbi Natan, third century, right? From this version of the story, that's basically what they're saying. It was the zealots who were who were um, not willing to to um, listen to reason. I'm sorry, was somebody saying something? Okay, missed it. Um, um, so the story goes on and Yohanan and Zakkai realizes that nobody's going to listen to him. So he tells his students, Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua, and he says, his idea, my sons, take me out of this place, make me a coffin, and they're going to take him out of 
Jerusalem in a coffin because they were only letting dead bodies go out. And they go and they come, bring the, uh, the dead body up to the gate. And they say, it's a dead body. You got to let us out. And they say, well, if it's a dead body, then go and take it out. He goes out in a coffin. He comes out and until he gets to Vespasian and they open the coffin and Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai stands up before him. And, and Vespasian says, so you're Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Ask for whatever you wish and I will give it to you. And Yochanan ben Zakkai says, I ask nothing from you except for Yavne. I'll go there. I'll teach my students. We'll establish prayer. We'll do all the meets vote. And Vespasian says, go. Do what you want. And then Yochanan ben Zakkai makes a prophecy. So in this story, how are you supposed to understand this image of Yochanan ben Zakkai escaping from Jerusalem in a coffin? What is that supposed to, what is that supposed to represent? Let me put it this way. What does it mean for somebody to get up out of a coffin? What is that? It's a symbol? resurrection. It's resurrection. Exactly, Anita. That's it's, it's resurrection. And the claim is that what Yochanan ben Zakkai did was Jerusalem was effectively dead. It hadn't yet been destroyed, but it was going to be destroyed. It was going to be dead. And Yochanan ben Zakkai, a coffin in Jerusalem, comes out and is resurrected upon leaving Jerusalem. And he, and, he, and he resurrects Judaism by establishing Yavne, where he's going to teach his students and establish prayer and do all the mitzvot. This is a hero story. So this is yet another response of the early rabbinic, of the early rabbinic movement. And um, one response is this claim, we go way back. We've got this, this unimpugned, perfect tradition that goes that, that goes way way back, and you can't say anything against it. And the other the other response is, and yet we had this tremendous discontinuous moment. The temple was destroyed, and if it weren't for us, if it weren't for Yochanan ben Zakkai, Judaism would be dead. But Yochanan ben Zakkai resurrected Judaism. So there's kind of like this hero claim about Yochanan ben Zakkai, and it's, this is an, this is a fairly early text. And an early image of like Yochanan ben Zakkai. So now we're gonna now in order to see why the Babylonian Talmud wins, we're gonna see the differences between what the early texts say and what the Talmud what the Talmud does with it. And this is probably the version that most of you have learned um, if you if you've studied this story about Yochanan ben Zakkai, specifically the story um, that you might know is called the story of begins with the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. Um, which is basically this guy accidentally invites his enemy Bar Kamsa to a party instead of his friend Kamsa. And when Bar Kamsa shows up, the host treats him horribly. But there were rabbis there, the, 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 the story says, and the, the rabbis don't intervene. They don't stop the host from treating Bar Kamsa horribly. And because of this, Bar Kamsa is furious with the rabbis. So he then manipulates the Roman emperor into believing that the Jews were rebelling. And then the story goes on and there are a variety of ways, but the point of all the different elements of the story is if rabbis don't act responsibly, if rabbis don't act with moral courage, if rabbis don't lead, they are responsible for destroying the temple. Right in the first story, it was the zealots who who wouldn't listen to Yochanan ben Zakkai. They were the ones who were responsible for the destruction of the temple. No, not the Romans. It's the zealots. But here, it's because the rabbis who were at the time didn't lead that they take responsibility. It was our fault. The rabbis say we blew it. And look how they talk about Yochanan ben Zakkai. Yochanan ben Zakkai. In planning, you know, can't, can't get anybody to listen to him. So he goes to Abba Sikra, who was the leader of the zealots. And he says, you know, I can't get them to do anything. And he says, what? And Yohanan ben Zakkai comes to him and says, How long are you going to do this? And you're going to kill everybody because they're all going to starve. And Abba Sikra says, What can I do? If I say something to them, they'll kill me. 
That is, everybody is denying personal responsibility. Even the head of the zealots is worried that if he's not a zealot and he tries to say, let's let's do something, that they're going to kill him. Sounds so, like Mitch Yoko, McConnell. Yes. <laughs> I, sorry. I'm not making it. Actually, it's your congregation. I can make all the political comments I want. Um, um, but that was all right. That was yours. Um, what can I do? So Abba Sikra says, pretend to be sick and then make it, then everybody should come to your, come and see that you're sick and then take something that's putrid, a dead animal and next to you. So it smells like you're sick and decomposing and put you in a coffin and take you out and make sure that you're, that, that you're, the, that, that everybody thinks, oh, he's sick and he smells bad and it's decomposing. This is horrible. And um, so it's not Yohan and Zakai's own idea. This is the idea of this zealot guy. And it's shameful. He has to make himself smell bad and put a dead rotting animal next to him. So Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua carry him out. And when they get to the gate, the gate, the, 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 um, the people who are at the gate want to pierce the body to make sure that it's dead, right? And th th there's, there's this, I mean, all these things that, again, would shame a normal person, much less a great rabbi. And then Yohanan ben Zakkai goes to, goes to Vespasian and he said, he greets him, greetings to you, my, the king, greetings to you, the king. And Vespasian says, you're liable for death on two penalties because I'm not the king. And if I am the king, why didn't you come beforehand? And then he makes this brilliant comment. He says, he says, you know, he, well, he makes a parable and, and, and he argues with him and he says, and ultimately, ultimately, um, Yohanan ben Zakkai says, well, you are a king and I couldn't come because there are zealots among us who did not allow us to do this, who did not allow us to come out to you. So again, Yohanan ben Zakkai here is not taking personal responsibility. He said, what could I do? There were zealots. They were keeping me from you. I would have come earlier, but I can't. I couldn't because I was under their control. It's all about denying responsibility. And then in a beautiful passage, Yochanan and Vespasian acts like the rabbi to Yochanan and Zaka. And he comes up with a parable. He says, if there's a barrel of honey and there's a snake wrapped around it, wouldn't they break the barrel in order to kill the snake? And that's why I have to destroy Jerusalem. And Yochanan ben Zakkai is silent. Now, Yochanan ben Zakkai's silence in response to um, Vespasian's parable is really problematic. And the Talmud does something that's unusual here, not unheard of, but unusual, where in the middle of the story, later readers' response to the story is inserted. So either Rabbi Yosef or Rabbi Akiva come and say, you know, Yohanan ben Zakkai blew it right there. Because sometimes wise men are turned backwards and their knowledge makes them, and, and they become foolish. Yohanan ben Zakkai should have said, you know, you take tongs and you remove the snake and then you kill the snake without destroying the barrel. That is, a smart person, a courageous person, would have had a response for Vespasian. But, but in this story, they're not, they're not hesitating to criticize Yohanan ben Zakkai. He was will, you, you have to take responsibility. If you don't take responsibility, what ends up happening? The temple gets destroyed. Rabbis have to show leadership. Rabbis have to show responsibility. So you see this huge difference, huge difference between the one story and, um, oh, I'm going to go back, um, between the one story in the, the third century, the Tenaitic story, where Yohanan and Zakkai has to be the unimpeachable hero, the guy who saved Judaism, this great guy. And by the time, the end of the Talmud, by the time of the Talmud, and this is really a passage that my teacher, my friend and colleague, 
Jeff Rubenstein argues is really the latest period of the Talmud, stuff that was written in the sixth or seventh century. Um, these these um, big long narratives, um, where instead of try, feeling that they have to say, "We rabbis are perfect, we rabbis are great," we have to say, "You know, sometimes we rabbis make mistake mistakes, and we have to learn from that. Because if we don't learn from that, we don't learn from your